Samantha. Well, hello and welcome to the Harvest at Home series. I am back once again here on Facebook, your host, Amanda McCrossin, and I am thrilled, or to maybe to borrow a, a phrase from my guest, absolutely delighted to be changing course just a tiny, tiny bit. Uh, we are shifting gears away from where we were before, which is uh, focusing on regions of California wines and switching to how to enjoy them properly. So um, we have Terry Turner from No Crumbs Left here today. It looks like maybe Terry is frozen. She's been in that position for an awfully long time. Um, so let me let me check and see what's going on over here. Because um, I cannot hear you, Terry. You are just frozen in time, my dear. Um, let's see. So I think what we might do is uh, is stop and start and try this one more time because we had her just fine just moments ago. It was all good. So in the meantime, um, oh, looks like maybe she's trying to reconnect. Let's see what's going on. We'll give her just a few moments, but maybe while uh, while she's trying to reconnect, I will just give you a brief overview of what we are trying to accomplish today. Like I said, we are moving away from just focusing on the regions of these wines uh, in California and moving to uh, a place where we are trying to learn how to enjoy them. And who better to do that with than Terry Turner, author of No Crumbs Left. She is a wonderful food blogger on Instagram. Uh, I have been friends with her for quite a long time. We met here in Napa Valley where I am right now, many years ago at the Napa Valley Film Festival and have stayed friends ever since. And she's sort of been my go-to guide for all things food. And uh, I think I her for all things wine. So um, let's see if we can't get her back in here. Let's see, let's see. All right. Hi. <laughs> we could hear you, you just couldn't hear us. Okay, okay. Well, now I can see you and I can hear you and you're doing your thing in the kitchen, which I love so much. You are making food and I've got wine. You've got wine too. Um, but I, I'm so I'm so happy to have you, Terry. We have been friends, as I as I just said, for a few years now. I met here in beautiful Napa Valley at the Napa Valley Film Festival and You've sort of been my guide and my inspiration, especially these last few months on how to cook for myself, especially now that, um, you know, I'm not in the restaurant world anymore, which I don't even know if you know, but I, I am not in the restaurant world. Um, and so I have lots of time to be cooking and making things and doing all my magic elixirs and having fun with all the wonderful No Crumbs Left recipes. So um, Terry, welcome to, uh, to our little Facebook Live. It's my pleasure to be here. I love showing up with you anytime, and I love talking about all things California grown. So I'm delighted to be here. Yes, you are um, such a great ambassador for California and all of the wonderful produce that grows here. So I couldn't think of a better person to kick off this series with. I do just want to put up your book here because I, I really am a very big fan of yours. In addition to being a friend, I use this book all the time. It's quite dirty inside, which I guess is a good sign for a cookbook. Um, but today we are going to be talking about entertaining at home, cooking for the family, two things that you are really, really sort of a master at. You cook for your family all the time. Um, I have been the great recipient of some wonderful things that you have cooked for me. Um, but we're going to be talking today about recipes that you can make at home for a, a large group or for your friends or for your family. And I'm going to be bringing the wines to the scene. So let's talk a little bit about what you, uh, how you approach cooking for the family and the recipes that you've brought for us today. Well, how I approach it is it's about, you know, um, eating, making something that you love to eat. So that's really, it, it happens to be that other people like to eat what I like to eat too, but it's always creating something delicious and layers upon layers and lots of recipe testing until you find something that is spectacular. Um, and I love cooking with California wine. So first of all, I'm going to have a little bit of the wine that we use in the piccata. Yes. Which is lovely, by the way. Yeah. So you're going to be doing a, a, a chicken piccata. Or you've really already done the chicken piccata and we're going to be talking about it. And you're going to be eating while I'll be drooling over here, showing us the beautiful goods. Um, you had mentioned to me one of your favorite things that you love to pair with the chicken piccata is Sauvignon Blanc. So, of course, being the sommelier that I am, I took your recommendation and I put a little twist on it. So I hope you don't mind. Not at all. It's absolutely delicious. And the sauce oh, good, is, good. is amazing. I've already made the sauce. And oh my gosh, you know, with the, between the butter and the capers and the wine, 
Um, it's truly, truly delicious. And what I'm going to actually do is take the chicken piccata. I love chicken piccata. It's so great for a family dish. It's also great if you're going to, you know, to bring something somewhere. So let me just see if I can get this in frame. Okay. Uh, there we go. Oh, thank you, Zach. That's, that's perfect. Okay. So here it is. And it's just, you know, taking a, a chicken cutlet and flattening it, it's butter, um, it's um, flour, and this is gluten-free flour, and cheese, putting egg on it first, and sauteing this until golden brown. It's actually, it's a little bit of work, but it's not hard. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, you have to get in there, and you've got to saute everything, and you've got to batter up each piece, but it is so delicious, and it's something, you know, not only just good on arugula, wonderful with potatoes, Great if you're taking a dish to go and magnificent leftovers. Yeah. So uh, Zach and Molly and I are going to be eating this. And <laughs> so what is it specifically about chicken piccata that makes this so one of your go-to dishes when you're entertaining for groups? Is it the simplicity of the recipe? Is it just that it's sort of a universally adored dish? Um, is there anything specific about it that you just love? Well, it's interesting. On the blog, always when we go, what are our top 10 recipes? What's our top 10 whole 30? Chicken is uh, typically in the mix. I think it's there's something for everyone. Everyone enjoys it. And this feels, you know, it's not terribly hard. It's it's a bit of prep. You know, one of the tricks of a chicken piccata is wet hand, dry hand. So when you're putting the chicken cutlet in the egg, you're using this hand, and then you dump it over to the bowl with the cheese and the flour, and then you're using this hand so that you don't get it all gloopy. So that's one of the hardest parts. And then it's just in some oil or butter, pan frying the piccata, um, to a golden brown, you know, making sure there's plenty of salt on it before you do it. And, you know, it's a masterpiece. You can put it in at 200 degrees and then you make your wonderful sauce with the leftover drippings, you know, with the butter, with the wine, with the lemon and capers. And it's, 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 it's easy, but everybody loves a chi chicken piccata. And, you know, if you get a good chicken piccata, they're just, it's an amazing dish. Do you like chicken piccata? I love chicken piccata. In fact, my my mom used to make chicken marsala as sort of like our group dish, but I I find that not everyone loves mushrooms, uh, and the chicken piccata is a little bit more uh, is is better received by wider wider audiences. And in fact, like whenever I'm at a restaurant that I've you know that's just sort of simple, you're out to dinner with friends or you're with your family, like I find it's just something that I always love ordering because it is just so simple and always sort of comforting. Absolutely. And when you get a good one, you hang on to that recipe. So I've had this forever. We've taken the recipe and we've done some things where we've made a Whole30 version. Mm -hmm. You know, So there are many different versions. You can do a keto version, a paleo version. But this one here is gluten-free because I, I eat gluten-free and it would be very easy to do non-gluten-free. But it's just, it's, it's just a, it's a real winner. And it's so just great on a bed of arugula. You've got a lovely salad. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty much a one dish entree. And if you want to add some roasted potatoes, it's a bonanza for sure. Yeah. Well, for wine, I mean, anytime you're dealing with lighter proteins like chicken or pork, I mean, generally your mind sort of gravitates towards white wine anyway, but then you add this sort of white wine sauce. And of course it has to be a white wine with it. So the wine that I chose, um, like you said, Sauvignon Blanc is a perfect pairing for this dish. You cannot go wrong with Sauvignon Blanc. It has all the brightness, the citrus, the lemon, all of the things that you would sort of think about when you're making that delicious sauce that goes on top of it. So a little savory, a little acidic, a little rich, um, which is why we love Sauvignon Blanc. But I decided to sort of take inspiration from chicken piccata, which is sort of an Italian dish, and Sauvignon Blanc, also a slightly more Italian wine, um, and get a, a Tokai Frilano. So is this a grape that you've ever heard of? Absolutely not. You know, I always say, people say they come to California for the wine. I come also for the produce, so I know more about <laughs> you know, the different mushrooms than I do about the wines. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. When I moved here from the East Coast, the produce was kind of what struck me first going to the, my very first, well, you've been a million times to the Stanley in the farmer's market. The first time you go to that farmer's market and like the smell and the color, it's just, I've never seen anything like it. Um, but this is Tokai Frilano. So this is an Italian variety. You don't really see it very much in California. It's sort of a, a tiny little grape, but um, this has been planted uh, at the Larkmead property, which is not too far from Calistoga Ranch, right off of uh, Larkmead Lane. Um, and what I love about this is 
you know, it has all the things that we love about Sauvignon Blanc, but it's just a little bit more floral and it's got slightly more savory than Sauvignon Blanc tends to have. So you'll notice it's got a little bit more of that lift and that brightness that we love about Sauvignon Blanc, which is going to sort of uh, bring up all of those great elements of the of the lemon that's in this dish and the salad that's in this dish. Um, but it's going to be uh, a little bit more textured, kind of it has enough weight, it has enough texture to hold up to the tannin that you have in, in the chicken uh, and the bread that's on there as well. It looks like maybe we we lost your video again, but I'm going to keep talking and drinking because I know that you can hear me. So um, this is, uh, like I said, not very not very widely planted in, in Napa Valley, let alone California, but Lark Mead, one of my favorite producers, very, very historic property uh, up in Calistoga. And this is made by a winemaker named Dan Petrosky, who just loves Northern Italian Friulian white varieties. So he's really a champion of this of this grape and uh, in fact has a label of his own called Masicon that champions that um, sort of uh, as an addendum to what he does at Larkmead. Um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about why I love this wine um, as we wait for you to come back. So you know, on the nose, you get all that brightness, all that great greenness, but there's a lot of uh, white flower, as I mentioned. Um, Tokai Frilano, you know, it's a grape that that can um, have many different personalities. This one doesn't really see any sort of oak, which means it's not going to have um, all of those baking spices and the intensity and the richness that you might expect from a Chardonnay. Oh, I think we got her back. There she is. Almost, almost, we were so close. <laughs> oh no. Well, I'll keep I'll keep talking. Hopefully she'll unfreeze. Um, but what I love about this wine is just how rich and how bright it is. And that's sort of the essence of this chicken piccata dish that Terry has made for us today. Um, there is a, an element of richness and there's an element of brightness. And I just love the universal appeal of this wine. You know, it, it drinks sort of sun-kissed. So it's, you know, it's California. So it's got a little bit of ripeness and richness, but it's not overwhelming. It doesn't feel, you know, too intense for somebody who loves more dry wines. It doesn't feel too dry for someone who loves more fruit. It's sort of like right in between. And as we think about entertaining for the family and, and cooking for large groups, I'm always thinking about versatility. What's going to pair with a lot of things? What's going to please a lot of palates? Um, and how can we how can we make it so that everyone can enjoy a glass of wine no matter what their preference is? And I think, you know, though this is a very, very small production wine, um, I just thought it would be fun to sort of push ourselves out of our comfort zone of Sauvignon Blanc and, and Pinot Grigio and some of those more comfortable varietals and just something that's a little unique. Um, what I love is Terry actually has uh, her wine in a tumbler, which I really, really recommend, especially for this holiday season. As you guys are starting to uh, to plot and plan all of your um, Thanksgiving and Christmas and holiday holiday get togethers that you're going to be having. Um, I love my stemware. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely love my glasses. Um, and I'm just trying to bring her back in right now. Um, however, I don't love to wash stems, as I'm sure many of you do not love to wash stems either. Um, and I also find that, especially in a group where there's a lot of sort of like hullabaloo going along um, and, you know, people reaching across, the one thing that you don't want in the way is a big glass and you certainly don't want it spilling over everyone. And so to that end, um, I love doing my wine in a tumbler. There she is. There I am cutting away. We can we can hear you the whole time and everything. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'll keep that in mind. I won't say okay. anything, anything crazy. Um, so yeah, so I was just talking about how much I love, you know, I love my stems. I love my wine glasses, especially when I'm, you know, it's more of like a me time. Um, but when I've got, you know, a group of like, you know, six to 10 people, tumblers are sort of my go-to. And I, I keep these, I mean, they're not expensive. They're very easy to wash. Um, and you know what? Wines like this that are you know, delicious but simple, really, really an excellent way to enjoy them just in something just simple like this tumbler. So it looks like you moved on to some, some beef there, right? Oh, this is an amazing pork and it's stuffed with California prunes, lots of wonderful spices. Um, and then also just, it's a, it's a boneless pork shoulder and then just in the natural crevices lots of prunes that we've stuck in and then we've made a lovely reduction of the red wine mm -hmm. and prunes and shallots and the pan juices and it is pretty much a dream i love it and if that's not enough then we've made an extra really kind of a black vinegar glaze um to put over it because i'm a double sauce kind of a gal and <laughs> so you can see this black syrupy it's just it's magnificent and for a holiday with a mashed potato it is divine 
And so the pork, is it a, is a pork loin? It's a pork shoulder? What kind of pork is this? It's a pork um, shoulder, should mm -hmm. be boneless. Um, and it really, it's not, it's like you, you, you know, put all the spices and herbs in and the prunes in the spice mixture and you really lard it in there mm -hmm. and then you roast it. Um, and then you really make a pan juice with the wonderful pan juices. You take this beautiful, beautiful California red and the prunes and some shallots and it adds to the pork fat and it's just, it's lovely. Yeah. So I love that you included prunes because California, especially here in Napa Valley, this is just such a hate. Well, it used to be like only prunes for a very long time before there was wine. It was lots of prunes in Napa Valley. And I, I remember talking to um, Chuck Wagner, who owns Camus, and he said, you know, at a certain point, my family had to decide whether or not they were going to go grapes or they were going to grow prunes, which of course, now in retrospect, we think about that and we're like, well, of course they should have grown grapes. You know, Napa Valley is such a, 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 a an icon for Napa Valley Cabernet, but at the time it was a very big decision and, and prunes used to be such a, a huge part of the agriculture here in Napa Valley. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we often get in these wines, uh, especially in Merlot here in California and Merlot in general, um, which we're drinking a Cabernet today, but there is a little bit of Merlot, I believe in, um, in just a little bit. Oh, this is 100% cap, but they have uh, Merlot and Cabernet tend to have sort of these like prune components to them. So they sort of smell a little pruney. They can taste a little pruney. And so when you said that you were doing this prune pork situation, I was like, well, we have to do, you know, a Napa cab that highlights all of that gorgeous uh, prune situation. We do have another red wine and I know you, um, you've got that too. I don't know which you use for which. I don't think it matters much, but I do love, I do love that you used the same wine to do the uh, to do the dish that you are to drink it. Yes, it's, I think it's a, just a wonderful way to do it. Um, this recipe is on the blog, and it's just such a winner, and it's so wonderful. Um, and I'm going to take a little bite of it. Do uh, it. I love, love the double sauce. Love the wine infused in. Um, you know, love the finished product. And you're not. How much wine are you using? Is it like a cup? Is it less than that? More than that? About a cup in the glaze. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> about a cup in the glaze and about a cup in the pan juice. Okay, so this is a perfect example of, of sort of what I was alluding to earlier with the chicken and the pork. So two, you know, lighter proteins. Um, you know, when we think of pairing wines, a lot of times I'm thinking of color. So you know, whiter meats tend to go with whiter wines, and the more color you get into uh, the dish, you're actually going to want to rev that up and move over to the red wine category. So um, pork can go either way. I mean, depending on how you make it, depending on what sauce terry you decide to to put on that and, and how you decide to prep it, um, you know, pork can go with, with white wine really, really well, something that's a little heartier, like a Chardonnay or a Viognier. But the way that you've done it today, it definitely wants a red wine. And so we've got two red wines to sort of bridge the gap. And I also um, wanted to point out that this Barbera um, that we've got from Oak Farm, this is actually something that if you absolutely wanted to have a red wine with that chicken piccata, even though we love the white, we all know some people just won't do white wine. So we have to sort of plan for that when you're thinking of everyone. Um, I love the idea of doing Barbera with chicken piccata because it sort of goes back to this, what grows together, grows together notion. So we try to pair wines that are uh, uh, indicative. Oh, you signed up for the event? Okay, there we go. We see you. We had you frozen for a minute there, but now we oh. see you. <laughs> um, I was just saying, you know, we love we love to do, part of the series uh, has been what grows together, goes together. Is this something you're familiar with, a concept you're familiar with? Well, I, it, I'm not, but it makes all the sense in the world. Of yeah. course, of course it would. Yeah, so this is like one of the most classic, uh, classic adages that, you know, goes back to historic regions like the Loire Valley in, in France, um, Northern Italy in Piedmont. Um, the wines that are grown in these regions or the wines that are made in these regions tend to pair best with the foods that come from there. And so when we're thinking about pairing some of these dishes, especially like the chicken piccata, I'm immediately thinking Italy. Um, and so I, you know, I sort of wanted Italian variety, which is why we chose the Tokai Frilano. And then alternatively, if you wanted to do a red wine, that's where we choose something like a Barbera, another Piedmontese Northern Italian red variety that um, definitely has like a California spin on it. This is from Lodi. This is called Oak Farm. Um, Barbera, not a grape that you see very often in, uh, in California in general, but again, just something that I thought would be kind of fun and, and interesting and also not terribly expensive. This is about 30, 35 bucks, um, all coming from a, a wonderful vineyard uh, uh, in the Central Valley. 
Um, Terry, we have you frozen again, but I'm just gonna keep drinking and uh, you're looking good. So hopefully I'm looking good too. And I will just make sure that we are, yeah, we're good to go. Um, so as we sort of wait for Terry, cause I know she's, hopefully she's getting a couple of bites of that delicious looking pork roast. Um, wanted to talk about a few different principles for entertaining beyond, you know, stemware and selection of wine. The other thing that I really love to do, I love to have wines with versatility, like I said, but I also love wines that are, you know, not going to be over the top that don't require a lot of uh, skill and decanting, you know, nothing that's too reverent. We don't love to entertain um, and be bound by, uh, constrained by some of the the, uh, the things that wine can often make us do, like decanting and, um, you know, crazy opening. So I always find that especially when I'm entertaining, it's not always, um, as much as we want to share our wonderful wines with all of our friends, not always the best time to break out that crazy bottle of wine that you've had since 1982. Um, sometimes when you're entertaining for the holidays, it's best to just sort of keep it simple. There you are. There I am. Yeah. But I've heard everything. That's the beautiful part. Good. Um, well, how do you feel about that? I mean, when you're entertaining, um, I know, you know, sometimes there's wine, sometimes there's not, but um, do you do you try to keep things as simple as possible on on the wine side or on the beverage side? I mean, is there is there always this this feeling of like let's just keep it easy and keep it about the conversation and about the people that I'm with? We we are not those people. We are the people that have like we have we have a beverage manager every year, and that's like Lucy will be in charge, and that's like figuring out every drink that everybody wants. It's finding, and I'm likely to text you and say I want something reasonable, but something that feels special. And I did that recently when we were celebrating someone's birthday, and you gave me a fantastic wine that I absolutely love that I wouldn't have gotten. Um, so I try to find a special wine that isn't crazy expensive. Maybe start with a lovely champagne, you mm. know, and then go to something you know. The simpler. We have a family member who actually loves to bring the wine if it's Thanksgiving, and he is a man who likes to get a special wine, and he brings it all. So we are people that like beverages. That's what I can say for sure. <laughs> I like beverages too, and I like having lots of different things on the table. Um, I someone was asking what the name of this wine with the beautiful label but does not show the name. Uh, this is Lark Mead, and this is the Tokaya Frulano. Um, I apologize, if there's a bit of a glare, but this is the 2018 vintage. I will say this is super tiny production, often often sold out a little too quickly for my taste, um, but a wine that I love to have around and a wine that I think, you know, can surprise people. Because I think, you know, as much as I don't love to have so much reverence around, um, you know, crazy expensive bottles uh, during the holidays and when I'm entertaining, I do love to like sort of surprise people. And there's this sort of notion of surprise and delight that I, I tend to enjoy. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll grab things like Tokai Frilano or um, even something like a, a great Gewurztraminer, which you can find all over the state of California. There's some right up here at Stony Hill. Um, I like to find you know, these smaller varieties like uh, like Barbera that we have here from Oak Farm. Um, and then also some of the classics. So you have a lot of different options to play with a lot of different palettes. And again, just going back to what we love about these wines is that, you know, they're not they're not wines that need a lot of help. They don't need to be some wines need to be in a fancy, fancy glass to perform really well. It's sort of like a high performance car, right? The more expensive the car is, the more likely you're going to have to put a lot of care into it and a lot of money into it. You know, sometimes we just want something a little bit simple. And I think, you know, around the holidays, that's sort of what it's about for me. So I want wines that are going to perform really well in simple vessels like this that aren't going to require, you know, three hours of decanting that aren't going to be throwing tons of sediment. And that's sort of my approach in general to the holidays. I love that Terry said that, um, you know, start with champagne. I think starting with bubbles of any kind for any celebration always a great way to go. I think there's nothing that says like we are celebrating more than bubbles. Do you agree? I totally agree. I mean, I think it's just like we're having a special moment. Let's go for it. And always my dad, when you, when you came in, there was like a lovely glass with a, with a beautiful champagne, often a pink champagne. And so we have the same ritual in our family for sure. Yeah. Can I tell you a secret about, about yep. pink champagne and pink sparkling? Yes. So it pairs with everything. It's literally the most universal wine pairing that you can have. So if you are ever in doubt, you're like, I don't know what to have. Sparkling wine is unbelievably versatile, but rosé sparkling even more so because you get a little bit more of the texture. So as you're thinking about maybe if you're like, I can only do one wine, it's all I'm capable of. Rosé sparkling and rosé champagne is a great way to go because you're going to start at the beginning and then it will carry you all the way through. You think about how it feels in your mouth when you're drinking, you're drinking sparkling, it like cleans it all up and it's got really great acidity to pair with oh, the foods, but the rosé factor oh, kind of like intensifies it. 
there we go. You're good. You're good. Okay, good. <laughs> oh. oh, no, not so much. Okay, well, we'll keep going. Um, so I still have my Barbera in front of me. I want to talk a little bit about how this wine is tasting, why I selected it. Uh, and like I said, if you were Terry and for whatever reason you decided to do chicken piccata and this roast pork and you're like, I can only have one wine or I want a wine that's very versatile, this is a wine that I think can move between both dishes very easily. Why do they move very easily? Well, for one, Barbera tends to be a lighter bodied grape. However, because this has just a touch of Petit Syrah in it, and because it's from California, which makes it a little bit warmer, um, and the grapes get a little bit riper, they get a little bit more texture, uh, this sort of sits in the middle. So if you're thinking about a wine that's you know sort of like not too light, not too heavy, um, not gonna hit anyone over the head with any sort of like crazy insane alcohol or crazy insane oak, Barbera is a great way to go. What we love about Barbera too is that it tends to have a little bit more brightness and acidity and lift. Um, so what I get on the nose here is lots of cranberry and cassis. Um, you know, I even get like a little bit of those pan drippings that I'm sure Terry is smelling right now um, with that gorgeous pork roast. We're gonna try to bring her back in once again. Um, we're trying to get her to reconnect. Um, and what I love is that, you know, it's sort of like, it's one of these great wines that can sort of ebb and flow. So it can play up with the dish, it can play down with the dish. So if it needs to take a little weight off, it can do it. If it needs to put it back on, it can do that too. Mm. Lots of, of those great cranberry. I think of Thanksgiving when I think of this wine. And Barbera is such a great grape for that because it does, you know, feels a little spicy. If you're someone that loves Zinfandel, that sometimes finds it to be just a little bit too um, on like the raspberry, strawberry, kirschy side of things, Barbera is a great way to go. You get all of that great spice. Um, I think Barbera sometimes can have that sort of Rioja, Tempranillo thing going on as well. So, um, you know, all of that great spice intensity, but this is like great laser focus, really wonderful acidity. And of course, when we're thinking about pairing wines with food, we love to have acidity because that's what's going to clean our mouths up and keep us very hungry and sort of salivating. Let's see where she is. All right, bring it back. And I'm just going to keep drinking my wines because that's what I do for a living. And I'm quite good at it, in fact. And so I, I want to see, um, you know, differences. Okay. There I am. Okay. There I think you're just jacking out to take bites of food. I, I'm yeah. very convinced of this. I don't Well, it seems we've lost her again, but that's okay. So I've got these two vessels, um, the uh, what I affectionately refer to as the Italian wine tumbler and um, my very fancy Mark Thomas stems, which you guys have seen me use a thousand times on these before. Um, what is the difference between glassware? Why, you know, why should you use something like this versus something like this when you're entertaining? Well, you're not going to get so much of the aromatic of this wine in a glass like this simply because, you know, you don't have that gorgeous bowl shape to kind of help the aromatics come out. Um, this is going to drink a little bit more simple. And to that end, um, if you are going to go this route uh, in the in the wine tumbler like this, I always recommend doing it with just a touch of a chill. I find that um, if you refrigerate your red wines for about 10 to 15 minutes before they're about to be served, um, they're that much more delicious. Hello, hello. <laughs> We've continued to drink and eat, so don't worry. We're having a great time. I, I knew that you would. I'm so thrilled. Um, <laughs> is there a wine that you're enjoying more than the other? Yeah. I mean, as a speed down. Can you see us, Amanda? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Good. We lost you. Yeah. Can, is there a wine that you're enjoying um, more than the other? Is there one that, there's always one that like seems to go down a little faster. Well, maybe she's frozen again. So maybe she drank all the wine. I don't know. Um, I I will say I love um, I love the the wine tumbler because it does give this wine a little bit more body and sort of like dampens the the acid on this wine at just a touch. And I just kind of like that a bit. Um, don't be afraid to to try both. I think that's you know it's a really fun experiment to to try a wine glass to try a tumbler. Um, it's it's a wonderful way to go. I do want to talk a little bit about this gorgeous nickel and nickel that we have here um, that really is more specifically for the pork versus the oak farm, which sort of went in between. Um, and this is a single vineyard, beautiful Napa Valley Cabernet from Oakville. Oakville, of course, being you know, one of the wonderful ABAs here in Napa Valley, so American Viticultural Area. Oakville is home to some of the best wineries and vineyards in Napa Valley. If you've ever heard of a little wine called Robert Mondavi, 
that is Oakville. So it's kind of smack dab in the center there as you're heading up Highway 29. If you've ever been here, um, you're about at the halfway point when you get to Oakville um, and you'll see Oakville Crossroad. If you've ever heard of Opus One, that is Oakville. Um, oh, <laughs> I, love that. I love that that's where you came back on. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There we go. There we go. There we go. Your sound is just a little strange. Um, is there? I was asking you earlier. Is there a? Is oh, <laughs> okay, that's all right. Um, so this is uh, nickel and nickel. This uh, all they do is single vineyards. So this is the John C. Sullinger Vineyard from Oakville. Um, the things that I love about Oakville, you always get intensity, uh, and you get it in different forms depending on where it is in the valley. Um, the wines do tend to be a little bit more uh, more intense, as I said. They kind of like beef up. They're very muscular sometimes, and so. Um, what I love about this wine is that it is very intense and it is it does have a lot of structure, but what it also has is softness. So it's not very abrasive. And I, I'm sure Terry's dish with those prunes mm -hmm. is a little bit softer and, and you know, it gives intensity. Um, it also is, is a dish that kind of like feels good in your mouth texturally. <laughs> You're it back. really does. Good. It feels really good texturally in your mouth. I love it. Yeah. Texture, I think, is one of those things. And maybe for food, too. I don't know how you find with cooking, but... Texture is one of those things in wine that I find is just like a little too overlooked sometimes. It's so important how we feel things in our mouth versus how we taste. Absolutely. And what I loved about using these is it's just, it's a rich, delicious, wonderful flavor. So great for holiday. Look at this, this beautiful sauce on it. And yeah. you've got the two sauces. Um, you know, we've got the sort of more syrupy one and we've got really the wine reduction and it's, um, with, and then the prunes over, it's, it's a let's go moment for sure. Mm -hmm. So start to finish, what is your, what is the total time that it takes to make this, this dish, this pork dish? Okay, you don't make the prune pork dish because you're having a, a last minute dinner. That's not okay. what this is. This is, you've got a holiday, you want to make a special dish you love to cook. Uh, the day before, you take the pork and you make the spice blend and you lard it and do all of that. And that takes you about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Then to actually cook it, it's, it takes three hours to cook. It's not, mm -hmm. you're not doing it at a high heat. So you do it on a Sunday when your mother-in-law is coming over, you've got a special friend, you might be doing it on Thanksgiving. Um, that's, that's the kind of day that you're doing it on. You know, we like weeknight e eating is great, but the truth is just like you enjoy a really special, wonderful bottle of wine that you might have, you know, for you and your partner, that's this kind of thing where it's really a, something special on a Sunday, get the family around the table and get everyone cooking. Okay. So in addition to this portrait, I love that, by the way, I think, you know, especially right now, I, I find that on Sundays I'm spending, you know, time with my sister and her husband and, and then their family. And um, what a great way to spend time with your family beyond the pork. I mean, you said mashed potatoes. Are there other things that you're sort of making alongside to accompany this? Well, this would be lovely with a, a Brussels sprout, a fabulous mm -hmm. with the green beans. So I think any green vegetable, I think a mashed potato, you know, and then this sauce that you can also, because you might make a gravy in the end, but frankly, this reduction sauce as an au jus, and then the, the, this other sauce, and I don't know what I call it, but it's, what is it? Called? What do we call it? The prune glaze. It's the prune glaze. Um, they're just fabulous together, and and it's lovely. You know, have have your other family member bring the mashed potato. Um, <laughs> do a simple, do a very simple green vegetable, but it's it's you're going to sit down and feel really loved and nourished, and like we've had something magnificent to eat. Yeah. When it comes to the actual, I've I've always wondered this because I you know I see these beautiful dishes that you you put out for No Crumbs Left. Um, when you're serving, is it something that you're serving? Are you cutting this this pork in no. advance and plating no. it? Are you having everyone just sort of like reach across and do their thing? What does that look like for you? Oh, maybe we maybe we will never know. I don't know. We have you in a beautiful sort of glazed looking off into the distance moment right now, which is great. It looks awesome. And I'm drooling over this pork. Um, and I hope that I have the opportunity to make that pork. Um, oh, there you are. Okay. What was the question? Um, the, okay. So the question was uh, serving. So, you know, we always see these gorgeous uh, presentations that you put out for No Crumbs Left, but I was always curious, how do you serve that? Is it something, are you cutting it and just putting it on the table, having everyone sort of grab themselves? Do you plate these dishes? How does that work? Well, it depends. For something like this, I mean, everybody just comes up and they take what they want. You know, you, you can get a 
a piece of piccata, get the arugula, things like this. On this one here, I would cut this, I would leave it on the cutting board, and then I would put the potatoes and the different sauces. My feeling on the platters is make a beautiful platter, allow people to get in there and serve themselves. Mm -hmm. you have a vegan member, they're not going to take certain things. If you've got someone that's gluten-free, so there's something for everyone because we have lots of different eaters in my house, for sure. Yeah. And, and when you're going to the to the market to find your things, what are, you know, what are some recommendations you have for people that, um, you know, don't buy produce all that often or don't buy uh, meat all that often? Maybe they're ordering it out and they're deciding to try this for the first time. Um, is there specialty purveyors that you prefer to go to? How are you approaching the shopping for this for something like this dish? I mean, for sure, I go to the farmer's, farmer's market, meet the farmers and growers. They have so much to teach you. You know, go and talk to the butcher. Find out what's on sale. How do you cook it? You, there's there's so many wonderful foodies that really want to share this information with you. And it's just, it's ours in the world to go out and take it and make it happen. So, mm -hmm. so often that's what you want to do is make friends with your food purveyors. I mean, Dirk's Fish, it's the most beautiful fish in the city. People say, why is your salmon so wonderful? And I'm like, because I shop at Dirk's and his product is amazing. And he has those relationships chips. So that's what I would first say. But there are, you know, simple, wonderful recipes like our bone-in everyday chicken breast. It's bone-in skin on, it's delicious, it's easy, and it's a great place to start. And I mean, the cookbook is wonderful, but come to the blog. We've got a free blog. There are so many wonderful recipes. And if you watch our step-by-step -step stories, you're going to get a lot of wonderful lessons. Last week in our Friday favorites, oh, it's this week, is 101 cooking tips. So we did an issue just devoted to people like my daughter, and perhaps you, you know, you know, devoted to what are some tips and tricks that I can help you go from, you know, just following a recipe to learning to cook from an intuitive place. And it was born out of, um, she wasn't a cook, you know, she went off and, you know, grew up and moved away. And recently I said, I'm going to do cooking tips. And she said, let me tell you all the cooking tips that I learned from you that really, really helped me. And she railed it off and Molly and I were sitting here and she railed it off. And we were just like, oh my gosh, this, this is an issue. Thank you. And so that's what cooking is all about, is all about, you know, beginning cooking because yeah. we've just got to start somewhere. Yeah, I, I am like Lucy. I When I moved to New York, I found myself with a bit of time um, and, and no company uh, because, you know, you live in these tiny little apartments and all of a sudden, you know, you don't have very much money. So you're finding yourself cooking a little bit. Um, and so I love that. I love that Lucy found that in you. I'm curious, what, what are some of your favorite tips? Can you share a few before before it goes out on Friday? Yes, absolutely. I mean, for example, uh, save your cooking juices. Um, today I made, I have it somewhere, I made some beautiful chicken, like for the chicken piccata. Here's a tip right here. When you, when you sit, let that sit in the oven at 200 degrees, all kinds of wonderful juices are going to come. Don't throw away those juices, whether you're making a roast chicken or an everyday roast chicken breast or this chicken piccata or this pork. These juices are shortcuts to deliciousness, whether you're pouring it over here or saving it for like a minestrone or a soup or, you know, something like that. Um, Zach, what are some of the fabulous tips? I'm just drawing a complete blank. <laughs> salt, your salt, your salt your greens. Always salt your greens. It brings out just the natural, wonderful flavors. Salt you know? them when? So like you wash them, you dry them, and then you salt them before you do anything else? Yeah, let's say you're getting ready to make a salad. Put it in the mm -hmm. bowl. First step, salt your greens. It just brings out the natural flavors and mm. takes the salad from okay to delicious. And if you pair it with my marinated onions, you know, you've got, you know, something right there. Another tip here was wet hand, dry hand. You know, do the egging over here and then do the flouring over here. But don't put this hand here and don't put this hand here. When you're waiting for food to be done and you're doing a couple of batches, put, uh, put a tray in the oven at 200 degrees so you can take these lovely chicken piccata, you can hold them, and they're not going to cook. They're just going to remain warm. Mm. Um, so, so we've got, and we've gone to other people, no crumbs left friends and family members. My sister's a great cook. She gives tips for high altitude baking. Um, remember, don't put the garlic in in the beginning. Wait a little bit later so the garlic doesn't burn. So lots of great tips that'll just help you go from following a recipe to learning to just embrace cooking. Yeah. I've already filed a couple of those away in my mental Rolodex. So thank you. The wet hand, dry hand, that one is great because I always find myself like just, it's a mess anytime I do any sort of like chicken piccata or, um, you know, chicken milanese. It's just always like yes, totally. crazy, like starchy hands and, you know, no hand to drink wine with. Um, I love that. And I, I love your marinated onions. That was a, that was a revelation as I'm sure many people have told you the marinated onions, you know, it looks so simple uh, in your book. It's just, you know, a, a few ingredients and it's very easy to do. And I, I had all these onions because I got a CSA box 
And I found myself, um, you know, I was like, well, shoot, what am I going to do with all of these onions? And I was like, you know, I've always wanted to try Terry's marinated onions and they were phenomenal. I found myself just like going back and back and back and eating them. Um, and the other, the other thing that I think also would be very, very delicious with, um, this Barbera is I finally made the confit uh, cherry tomatoes. Yes, um, right. Wow. Oh my gosh. My family was over there. I made it for my mom and my dad and we had some delicious wine. And then I ended up adding in uh, that to some pasta. Um, and oh my gosh, it just totally changes the trajectory of those tomatoes. And I happen to be in Florida where tomatoes are a, a bit of a situation and not in a good way. Um, so <laughs> confiting them, you know, brought it up a notch a little bit for me. Um, and as you're thinking about tomatoes, Barbera is one of those one of those red wines that can go really, really well with tomatoes. So um, keep that in mind next time you're you're using that. Um, as far as prep, I mean, I know you're such a uh, such a great prepper. Um, your magic elixirs, I've made a number of those myself and kept them in the fridge and had them ready to go. Um, can you share some of your favorite magic elixirs and like the ones if people don't know you, they've never met you, um, the ones that you think they should start with, maybe like one or two? Well, I mean, of course, we love our, our, our um, almond sauce, our creamy almond sauce, our spicy yeah. almond sauce is good on so many. Time, right? it's, it's great for sort of any kind of Asian-inspired food. You know, we love the pistachio pesto. We did a wonderful one for California olives, which is a can uh, it's a, like a garlic olive creamy dressing, which is so delicious. Uh, we've got a new uh, spicy poblano one. So we've got a whole page of magic elixirs. You can come over and, you know, get the recipes. Um, and, and there's never a time, you know, that we don't have marinated onions on the counter. <laughs> Typically, by the way, we've got like two. Yeah, you got a little over there. Oh, well. But we've got two or three going. I love it. And you always have the best bowls, those no crumbs left bowls. You gave me one. They, it is, it's sitting right there. And I that is one bowl that I will never give up. It's my I favorite love bowl. I love it. <laughs> well we've we've had some wine we you ate some food i'm definitely on the hungrier side of things um just a refresher for those of you who uh who maybe are just joining us or didn't catch what we were doing earlier um we talked about three wines terry did two dishes so uh, she did the chicken piccata which looks so delicious and yummy one of my favorite dishes uh, to cook for myself and obviously terry for groups um the chicken piccata with this gorgeous Lark me Tokai Friulano. I'll turn this around again so you can see. This is the same font that they've had for, I think, about a century now. So it's kind of the same label, which I love. So Tokai Friulano for the chicken piccata. Um, so that was the white wine. And then we also had that sort of that in-between wine, that Barbera from Oak Farm. So if you've got someone that, you know, once you're making chicken piccata, but your guest is only drinking red wine, even though we love chicken piccata with a white wine, this is a great wine to do that with. This is Barbera from Oak Farm, which like I said, you don't see a lot of Barbera in the state, just like you don't see a lot of Tokai, but a great Italian variety that we, I think do really, really well in California. And I hope we see more of. And then last but not least, uh, the nickel and nickel, single vineyard john sullinger vineyard cabernet sauvignon which is going to pair beautifully with that roast pork um, and california prunes dish that terry prepared for us so this is the one for that the barbera for maybe sort of in between and then the lark meat for the tokai but you know what do what you want it's all good at the end of the day drink what you like drink what feels good open the bottles if you feel inspired use whatever glassware you want and have a lot of fun with it which i've always enjoyed about you terry you keep it fun you keep it light you keep it simple for us for you know the folk that didn't grow up in a, in a chef kitchen um you know your your recipes are very easy to follow and even someone like me can follow them and, and drink wine in the process and not feel like you're gonna have a misstep absolutely one of the a couple of the other recipes that I just want to mention in the cookbook, we've got the celebration seafood pasta, which is made delicious, you know, with red wine, with white wine. Yeah. And let's not forget risotto. I mean, risotto yeah. is spectacular, so easy. You've got to have, you know, the hand to stir. But uh, it's just, you know, to me, it's one of the most soulful things you can make on a Saturday night, you know, with your loved ones. And it's just, it's just, it's just the very best. And in the cookbook, the Mediterranean chicken stew is whole thirty, but sub out the chicken stock for a lovely white wine like this and it would be spectacular with California. I have to tell you when I, when I mentioned um, being in New York for the first time, risotto was one of those things that I used to make for myself on Sunday nights. I just, I'd have all this time and I wouldn't know what to do with it. And I, you know, it was very cheap to buy or, arborial rice and, um, you know, grab a bottle of wine and, and feel like you're a sophisticated woman of the city. So Absolutely. I love risotto. I love risotto for myself to have it for leftovers. I love it for the family. I have been uh, privy to your seafood pasta, which is 
out of this world dynamite. You love them. That's right. <laughs> um, and uh, my goodness, what fun. We are following this up tomorrow on Instagram. I will be with Aida Mullenkamp of Salt and Wind, and we are going to be talking about um, sort of this notion of like California Italian, so Calatel, uh, a, a Europe-centric California. So many of you, I'm sure I know, uh, sure, I'm sure you know, um, California is heavily inspired by Europe. So she's bringing a gorgeous recipe that she was inspired by. Uh, and I'm bringing back this Barbera that we had from Oak Farm tomorrow. Um, and then we will be back next week again here on Facebook, continuing our Harvest at Home series with more lifestyle and entertaining cooking. Um, I won't reveal who we're here with to, uh, next week, but we will be here at 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, and what a delight to have Terry Turner of No Crumbs Left. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. If you're unfamiliar and you don't have your her book thus far, I highly recommend you get yourself a copy. Go over to your Instagram, give her a follow, and check out the blog. Uh, Terry, did I miss anything? I don't think you did. What a pleasure. And I what I, I want to do is I want to talk to you afterwards because I'd love to have you on my podcast next week. Oh, my gosh. I would love to do your podcast. We're talking all about these wonderful things. So yes, we love absolutely. To from California, for sure. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here with us. And I'll look forward to chatting with you about a little podcast talk next week. Okay, great. Thanks for having me. Of course. Bye. -bye. Bye.